a very, very, very warm welcome to everyone joining us tonight um, for our first collaborative Young IFAS and UCT Africa um, webinar. We are so excited and we are so privileged to have wonderful international guest speakers. And we also have our own uh, Professor Shazi up here, who's also going to be chatting to us tonight. And we have some really lovely people on this call. We're so excited for this collaboration. We look forward to building a really good relationship and, and building on the relationships that we've already established. Um, we probably will give one or two minutes only um, for other people to join. We've got a very large amount of participants joining tonight, so that's really good news. Um, we're going to try and stick to the time quite, um, quite strictly. Um, some of our guests also have other clinical, um, clinical commitments, um, so we'll try our best to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, there will be a transition through um, a few screen shares, so bear with us if that takes a few minutes. What I will ask is that make, please make sure that your mic is muted when you enter the meeting. We have very large amounts of people and it's quite disturbing for the guest speakers when there's noise interference. There will be, um, hopefully there'll be some time for questions. Um, I would prefer if you can please type your question function um, and then we can try and address them or group them together as we go. Um, so tonight we're still admitting a few people, um, so, but I think that we won't delay anymore. So from the UCT ENT um, perspective and certainly from our African platform, we want to thank everyone for being here, for really making um, the time. I'm now going to invite our uh, Professor Shazi up here um, to take over the floor and also to introduce some of our guests and tell us a little bit about young IFAS um, and really get us excited for the meeting. So Shazia, without further ado, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Louisa. And thank you for putting all of this together so swiftly. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, Shazia, we can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. So, um, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, on, uh, on behalf of the University of Cape Town, the Division of ENT Surgery, where I am based and where I work, as well as the Young IFOS, the Yo IFOS team and the Education Committee, um, who I, Shazia Pia, and Francois Simon are the um, managers of, we want to warmly welcome you to the first collaborative educational webinar. And we're so pleased that we have this global platform with what promises to be a fantastic um, presentation. We have some exciting um, discussions and some brilliant speakers. And I hope that you enjoy this event and take home uh, much from it. Uh, so without further, further ado, I'm just gonna proceed and tell you a little bit about um, Yo IFOS. So Yo IFOS was established in Paris in 2017, and it was at the 21st IFOS World Congress. And essentially it's a breakout young physicians group. And it was aimed at young otolaryngologists between the ages of 30 and 45 years. And those people who were looking at establishing or were already in academic careers and who had a special interest in education and training. It also included optimal representation and inclusivity of all continents, according to the IFAS constitution, as well as all ENT um, subspecialties. Our current leadership is um, the president, Dr. Nicolas Fakri, and the secretary, Dr. Natasha Tessier. And what's also impressive is that there are uh, representatives from all regions in the world that extend across the globe. So when your IFOS first started, um, a lot of this, the, the discussions um, pretty much focused into four main topics. And the first one was to improve international mobility of young ENT physicians. And that was to start a global network, but also to initiate a website that would then be um, sustainable and would offer people the opportunity to expand. The second goal was the networking of clinical researchers in a given field, and that was through collaborative works, collaborative research, that would also include meta-analysis and systematic reviews, and then teaching materials and international guidelines, and this was to be formulated by the members of the team and to make sure it was open access. And then the last goal was to improve participation of young ENT physicians in international meetings and, and scientific uh, meetings and congresses. And so these goals pretty much 
uh, followed through and became established into what we currently have as the committees. And so we have four committees, a network committee, research, education, and Congress organization. And that's where most of the activities rotate around. And so if you get a chance, I would highly recommend going to our website, the Yo IFOS website. It tells you a bit of background about how it all started, but also what's impressive is it tells you what activities are um, happening and how you can get involved and how you can register. And also, you can get a lot of educational tools from the website. It um, not only provides information for trainers in education, but also about um, if, if you're interested in an academic career. There are 723 official members, and one can see that it is quite diverse, spreading across the globe. And the website is very often uh, visited. I think what is for me quite astounding in a short space of time was the total number of publications that amounted to 86, and this was audited back in December 2020. Um, and it includes a whole host of subspecialties. Probably for me, the most landmark presentation, the most landmark publication was by um, uh, Francois Simon. And, and this, the reason why I like this and, and I'm bringing it up is because not only did it collaborate with people all across the globe, all across subspecialties, but it also set up the ivory guidelines, the instructional videos in uh, autolaryngology. And um, not only did this get published, but it, it also ushered in an opportunity for people to submit videos that would then be eligible for uh, publication in the European Annals of EMT. So that was quite a nice achievement and well done to Francois for that. What was also quite remarkable was in 2020, the COVID-19 Yo IFOS task force was, uh, was, was established. And I think it set a precedence for how far Yo IFOS could reach. People in this pandemic were feeling very isolated, but what was definitely not short was the, was the resource uh, of, edu of, of educational tools. And um, Yo IFOS also was uh, able to provide and disseminate information, not only in English, but in multiple languages. And this was used as an online learning platform. <laughs> Quite remarkable was 33 publications. And, um, and we worked across the globe. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea, and my, this is my last, um, my last slide, was that we're doing this being the first of three virtual educational webinars and hopefully on multiple global platforms. Um, and I hope that once you join this one today that you will um, be interested in joining the following two that uh, we will host um, towards the end of the year. I also would encourage involvement in the educational committee and specifically on, on collaborative research on the international networks, but also on the online basic science textbook that I'm involved in with Francois. So have a look at the website and um, if you're interested, please register as a member and get involved. So about today, I'm sure you've read about the flyer and the first person I'm going to introduce um, is Dr. Briac Thierry, and I'm delighted to introduce him because I, I must say I'm very fond of him, and he's a brilliant, um, a brilliant speaker, and he's a very skilled airway specialist. Um, and just to be more formal, I want to say that um, Briac hails from Paris. He's based there. He's a specialist pediatric otolaryngologist, and he works at the Necker. Zenfant Maladie Hospital, and he's also affiliated to the Assistance Publique Hôpital au Paris, the Université de Paris. I hope that that was good enough. Um, so today, Briac is going to speak to us about laryngomalacia. And without further ado, you have the stage, Briac. Thank you very much, Sazia. Thank you very much for inviting me. I will try to share my screen and I think it's okay now. We can see your screen. Thank you, Briac. Yes, but I think, yes, here we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for, for inviting me. I'm, it's an honor to, to talk to you uh, today about Laringo Malassia. We will have uh, uh, the first 30 minutes uh, to discuss about the diagnosis of laryngomalacia and uh, what it is and how to treat it. And uh, the first question that we are going to, uh, to, 
to try to answer is uh, what it is and how we can uh, make the diagnosis quite easily. And this is the first fibroscopy just to introduce the subject about, about uh, a laryngomalacia. And you can see definitely that the larynx, you can see it quite clearly, but it's difficult to see the vocal folds um, in this larynx. Sorry. So what is a laryngomalacia? And it, it will be the first, um, the first thing that we are going to define. It's an inward collapse of the supraglottic airway structures. And it's the most common congenital anomaly of the larynx. And it's the most common etiology of inspiratory stridor in the neonate. It's very usual. It's a, it's a clinical uh, stuff that you are going to see very frequently. And it's very important to know how to deal with it and how to make the diagnosis. There are three pathophysiological theories. Um, the first one is that there is, there is a defect in the cartilage of the larynx and of the epiglottis and the retinoid and the cricoid, and, uh, or an at anatomical defect of the larynx. The second one is an, that there is something underlying, like, like a neurological cause. And the third one is due to uh, uh, reflux. I, don't know what it is for real. I just know how to recognize it. And I cannot say to you right now which is the best theory because we don't have the answer for this. Which is important is how to, uh, why a neonate is going to see you in the ENT clinic. And the first, uh, the first symptom is the stridor. And you have a neonate with an inspiratory stridor. Um, which is quite clear. It's a high-pitched uh, tone, uh, and it, it's going like, ah, 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 ah. and it's very easy to uh, to listen to it and to recognize it and to recognize the strider. Um, it intensifies during uh, increased airway demands. That's to say, uh, it's difficult to cry because it it. it uh, uh, you need to have more breaths and you will hear the strider more during feeding, during uh, supine position. Usually it happens very um, early in life, but it could happen uh, till the, the third or the fourth uh, weeks of life, usually. Uh, you have late onset um, uh, laryngomalacia, but it's not so frequent and you have to be aware that it's not the most clinical, the most frequent clinical form. Um, what is important is, is uh, the laryngomalacia. Uh, will have um, different uh, clinical sides, uh, clinical signs, and it can be very mild to severe with uh, apnea, cyanosis, and uh, uh, death threat uh, um, happening. Uh, also, you can have feeling difficulties, um, regurgitation, reflux, and uh, it could be associated with uh, neurological abnormalities and genetic, genetic syndromes. Um, it's also important important to uh, remind that a large proportion, well, like, like it's difficult to say because the literature varies uh, greatly, but a lot of these patients have also synchronic, synchronic airway lesions. But if you are not looking for it, you, you will not find it. And you have to look after the second uh, synchronic airway lesion. And it's very important. Once you have a neonate in your, uh, in your clinic, you have to uh, define which type of uh, laryngomalacia it is and how severe it is. So the first history, very simple. Uh, it's a moment of onset of symptoms. And I told you it's very early in life. And the severity of the dyspnea. Do you, can you, can you uh, looking at the child, can you see a chest retraction? Uh, does he have apnea uh, during, uh, during sleep? And uh, uh, does he experience death, uh, death spell uh, during nights at home? Uh, you have also to know uh, which type of progression um, the, the neonates have. Uh, is it worsening or not? And uh, you have to ask questions about uh, uh, feeding, regurgitation, and weight gain. One of the questions and ask, I ask uh, the parents, and I think it's quite easy to have an answer and, and to make a, and, and to see if it's severe or, it, or if it's not, if it's the feeding is more than 30 minutes. If you have a neonate and it's so difficult to have a feeding, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's taking much more than 30 minutes, definitely it's something which is severe. Uh, 
you also have to ask for and to look after the comorbidities because it's not the same thing to um, cure a child with a laryngomalacia with or without cardiac, neurological, and respiratory disease, and also craniofacial dysmorphism. And you will see craniofacial dysmorphism in uh, uh, Down syndrome, uh, in uh, fasciocraniosenosis, uh, and all the pathology of uh, the bone of the face. Just after the, the, the very, uh, this, um, this slide about assessment, we are going to ask the question when we have to do all this stuff. But first of all, let me answer uh, the, 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 the patient assessment. When you have the child in, in your uh, clinic, you need to uh, make the general ENT exam and you have to uh, uh, look at the, the strider and the dyspnea and all the, the stuff that we just talked about. And you have to perform a transnasal flexible laryngoscopy because this is the way you are going to uh, validate the, the first hypothesis that the strider, the noise that you, that you can hear during the, consulta the consultation is really due to a laryngomalacia. The flexible uh, laryngoscopy that you will perform, you will do it during the consultation in an awake uh, children. Uh, you can put some local anesthesia in the nose if you want to. Uh, I think it's not necessary, but definitely there is one thing which is very important for me, is not to go under the vocal folds during the consultation because you, are, because you don't need to go there and because it could be difficult if you have a laryngospasm in consultation. And there is this is definitely not the place you want to have to do uh, resuscitation uh, procedure. So laryngospasm is, is not a good thing to have uh, in your consultation. So I, I do not uh, go under the vocal folds during the consultation. And here you can see, as soon as you've performed the flexible, you can see three different types of laryngomalacia, and I will show you pictures just after. The first type, the type one, is an anterior collapse of the aryepiglottic folds and inspirations. The second one is uh, uh, a tubular epiglottis and a medial collapse of the aryepiglottic folds and inspiration. And the third type is a posterior collapse of epiglottis. Uh, the classification that I, that, I, that I use, sorry, is the classification of Olney. And you have here uh, the definition. The type one, you can see that the arytenoids are, are going uh, uh, in, into the, the vocal folds in the aspiration. In the type two, you've got this epiglottis, uh, which is tubulized and the very short uh, aryepiglottic folds. And in the type three, you can see that the epiglottis is going uh, backward uh, onto the, the larynx. And you have you will have the, you have the, the pictures at first, and you and you will see the little drawings that we are going to um, uh, have another time during this presentation. So, what are the treatment options? So, as soon as you know that there is a, a laryngomalacia you want to treat, the first one is a feeding strategy. You can uh, um, um, sorry, uh, you can, uh, uh, we'll see this after. Uh, you can have just medical treatment and anti-reflux medication. You can do some non-invasive ventilation if you think it's a good way uh, for this child. Or also, you can, you can do a supraglottoplasty during a rigid laryngoscopy. And you are going to see uh, uh, when to perform all of this. The first, you definitely need to know if the laryngomalacia, so in the consultation, you, you did the flexible, you know it's a laryngomalacia, so the strider is due to the laryngomalacia, but you have severity signs, uh, and you have to look after these signs, constant strider, failure to strive, apnea, hypoxia, cyanotic spells, or also another sign that you cannot see the vocal folds on the fibroscopy in the consultation. Sorry. Um, I show you this algorithm because I think, well, when I show you this, you're going to tell me it's going it's to be difficult. Oh my God, this presentation is going to be awful. But in fact, everything is described on this and we'll, we will uh, see each point uh, uh, one by one. And you, you're going to see it's very easy and everything is written on this. 
And you can also find the, the, the reference and the article because it's from Dobby uh, 2013 and very easy to find. The first one, uh, you have a patient, uh, you are not the ENT, you are just a pediatrician at this time. You have a strider with mild symptoms and you will, and you will, you will have to discuss if a flexible friboscopy is needed to confirm the laryngomalacia or not. If you have the ENT, probably you will perform it. But if you have the, pedi the pediatrician, you can discuss not to do it. And you, you can do, as the, at this time, a periodic visit to the pediatrician to see if the child is going better after. But probably no ENT intervention is required in case of spontaneous resolution. So if you just have strider with mild symptoms, maybe, and this is the first line, you have a suspicion of laryngomalacia because you just have only the strider, but you didn't perform the fibroscopy. Just do the periodic visit to pediatrician for, for the, the monitoring of the symptoms. And if the child is going better, so he's healed, he's cured, and you don't have nothing to do. The second one is the laryngomalacia with moderate symptoms. The child doesn't have any comorbidities. The weight is normal. The feeding is quite good. The voice is normal. You just have an isolated strider with uh, uh, no cyanotic spell, but you have cough and you may have uh, feeding difficulties. So you will perform the uh, fibroscopy. You will find the laryngomalacia. And so you, you can see, you can, at this time, you can just put some acid suppression therapy and feeding strategy. At this time, there is no need for uh, supraglottoplasty. So, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, this is all the blue stuff. So suspicion of laryngomalacia, it's moderate to severe. You are going to see the pediatric otorhinolaryngology. He performs the flexible fibro fear optic laryngoscopy. Everything is in blue. And you have mild to moderate laryngomalacia. And you just need to do feeding strategies. And you can put some uh, uh, anti-reflux medication. And after, you just follow and you have the, the clinical follow-up. If it's severe symptoms or comorbidities, that's to say you have apnea, cyanosis, failure to thrive, or you have comorbidities, it's another story. You just you perform the uh, laryngoscopy, the flexible in the office. You can see the laryngomalacia, but you have severity signs, and you will perform the rigid laryngoscopy and the bronchoscopy to perform a supraglottoplasty. And we are going to talk about this in a few minutes. And also, there is something that I want to talk about. If you have a strider and the patient is in your ENT clinic, you definitely will perform the fibroscopy because the patient is in your clinic. And you cannot find a laryngomalacia. That's to say the larynx is normal, but the child is having a strider. So it's not a laryngomalacia. And you definitely need to perform a laryngoscopy or a bronchoscopy to identify another airway lesion. And after, you will do the endoscopic surgical treatment as required for its pathology, which is not a laryngomalacia. This is very important to have this in mind, because if you, if you are not looking for, that's what I told you at the very beginning, if you're not looking after the second lesion or another lesion, you won't find it. And you will not find a valecular kist. You will not find a kist under the vocal folds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to remind this. So it's, uh, you have a suspicion, uh, suspicion of laryngomalacia. You do the flexible in the office. You, you don't have any laryngomalacia findings to explain the stridor. So you will perform the rigid laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy to identify, to treat the, the other airway lesion. So you saw that with, with this algorithm, which is quite difficult at first, uh, in fact, you have everything. There is something uh, I, I didn't discuss and I, and I will not. It's the place of the tracheostomy, which is under and which is not so frequent for the laryngomalacia. Um, there is another type. Um, and maybe we'll have time to discuss about this, uh, which is the specificity of the type one laryngomalacia. When you, when you see the arytenoids, which are collapsing on the anterior part and on the, on the vocal folds, I think uh, 
And we may discuss about this. It's often associated with comorbidities and especially the neurologic disorders. And when I found uh, when I find uh, the type one laryngomalacia, we definitely perform if if you have some severity signs, we definitely perform the treatment. That's to say, the supraglottoplasty. But usually, we have disappointing results of the supraglottoplasty because all the larynx uh, is collapsing and uh, it's not as uh, as good as the other type uh, of laryngomalacia. So in conclusion, just for the diagnostic, when to wait when you have a mild, a mild laryngomalacia, when to start a medical treatment when you have a moderate and a severe laryngomalacia, but you also have to operate if you have a severe laryngomalacia or comorbidities. And when to perform a rigid endoscopy if you have the severe laryngomalacia, or if you have a strider with a laryngomalacia. Okay, it was just the beginning, and we are going to talk about the surgical treatment right now. So what is the uh, surgery for the laryngomalacia? Uh, no, we are not going to talk about this, I'm sorry. Uh, the treatment of the, of, the, of the laryngomalacia is called the supraglottoplasty. Uh, it's a surgical treatment of the supraglottic structure, and in order to avoid inspiratory collapse. But supraglottoplasty uh, all by itself, it doesn't mean anything. And, you will, and we will see how to divide each treatment in the supraglottoplasty so that it can be uh, more easy to deal with. We've, we've just saw the clinical presentation, type one, type two, and type three. And we can also uh, due to each clinical presentation, uh, see which kind of surgery we can perform. So if you have a type one and the retinoids are collapsing onto the vocal folds, maybe it's time to perform an arid, arid, sorry, aritenoidoplasty. And we will see this. The type two, you have short vocal folds. And it could be easy to have a section of the ariepiglottic uh, ari folds. And the type three, uh, the epiglottis is falling uh, backward, and you will perform an epiglottoplasty. So with the first clinical presentation and the, the different types of laryngomalacia, you will associate for each type um, a different type of surgery. And this is very important because it, I think it makes everything much clearer uh, as soon as you have this in mind. Um, so the section of the, of the aryepiglottic fold is, is quite easy. I will show you some video just after. The surgery of the arytenoids, it could be the debulking of the arytenoids, or it could be an arytenoidoplasty. And surgery of the epiglottis could be an epiglottopexy but as for me, I, uh, it's very uh, rare that I perform epiglottopexy uh, with notch, but uh, uh, we perform uh, epiglotto, uh, thermal coagulation of epiglottic mucosa, which have quite the same results. And it could be also epiglottectomy or resection of mucosa along the, the lateral epiglottis. You can use different devices, but you have, you have to keep in mind, but that it's, uh, it's easier to have thermal injuries uh, with the laser and, you, and probably it's difficult to use this one. Anyway, uh, plenty of, uh, of, uh, of devices have been uh, uh, talked about in laryngomalacia. You, you could perform all of this. Uh, as for us, we, we use uh, um, the cold steel micro scissor for the section, and we used uh, a laser for the epiglottoplasty. So debulking of the arytenoids for the type 1 um, uh, laryngomalacia, you can, you, we can perform a debulking of the arytenoids. And I will show you some little movies. You can see that the, the, the left, the right, sorry, arytenoid is collapsing at inspiration onto the vocal folds. And you definitely understand why there is a strider for this child.
Okay, so debulking of the arytenoids will be to take off the mucosa, which is redundant. I did it with cold scissors. Will cold steel instrument. Uh, it seems to be bleeding, but in fact, it's not so much. And it's very easy to take the mucosa off the arytenoid. All of this has been performed during a, 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 a laryngo uh, tracheal endoscopy uh, in the operating room during uh, general anesthesia, and the child uh, kept uh, spontaneous ventilation. And uh, for this, we use uh, OptiFlow uh, as a, a, a method of ventilation, because we think uh, you have uh, the best results uh, for avoiding desaturations. So you can see it's not bleeding so much. And in the end of the surgery, you don't have this redundant mucosa on the right arytenoid. So this was an example of the debulking of arytenoids. If you have a type 2 laryngomalacia and the, the aripiglottic folds are short, you can have the section of the uh, aripiglottic folds. And this is example, I, this is not a video, this is just images. You can see, you can see the vocal folds, but you can see also that uh, the aryepiglottic folds are short. And we are going to perform the section with cold steel scissors also. Um, and it's uh, done also during an endos laryngotracheal endoscopy uh, under general anesthesia with spontaneous breathing. And we also used an OptiFlow for this, uh, which is a transnasal uh, ventilation. And in the end, uh, you can see that the vocal fold, both vocal folds has been uh, uh, cut, and you can see better the, the, the vocal folds. Sorry, the, the aryepiglottic fold has been uh, cut, and you can see uh, better the vocal folds. Another uh, another uh, images, and you can see before before the surgery. Or you can see quite clearly that it's difficult to see the vocal folds, and you cannot see uh, them. Uh, the the epiglottic the epiglottis is tubulized. The aryepiglottic folds are quite short. Uh, this child, uh, for sure, has some severity signs and needed to be and needed to have an endoscopic uh, treatment. So we perform the section of the epiglottic folds, and you can see after the section. Uh, what is important during the section is to be very near the epiglottis um, and, to, and to avoid uh, going too deep uh, into uh, the larynx. And you just have to cut the folds and, and not after. And in the end, you have an, another treatment is the epiglottopexy or epiglottoplasty. And I will show you a movie. So you can see that the epiglottis is falling backward. And we will perform, oh, I will pause this. So we have performed thermal coagulation of the epiglottis um, on the lingual uh, face of the epiglottis. And also we performed an arytenoidoplasty of the right arytenoid, and also we cut uh, the, uh, the aryepiglottic folds, both of them. So we combined all the, all the treatment that, that I've showed you uh, just before. Um, and so this is important. As soon, it's very, uh, for the understanding, it's very clear to divide all the treatments that you can do. But once you are in the operating room, you can, of course, perform uh, all of them.
and I will show you. Yes, and this one is an example of the uh, epiglottis, which is uh, being inspirated into the vocal folds in, at each inspiration. And on this one, oh, sorry. And on this one, we also perform an epiglottoplasty. So the thermal injury of the mucosa of the, of the epiglottis make it, makes it bend uh, uh, and not uh, uh, falling down on, onto the vocal folds anymore. You can also perform it with suture. I don't really have uh, the experience of this, but it has been described with quite good results. Um, the first, when you perform this, you have to remove the mucosa first of the vallecula so that um, the stitches are not going to last very long, in fact. But what is important is you remove the mucosa first so that it will heal. Uh, and uh, um, so the, the, by healing, the epiglottis will not fall down in the vocal folds anymore. You can also perform an, epi an epiglottectomy uh, when the vocal folds is, is falling down and completely falling into the vocal folds, which is not so frequent uh, also. And you can perform uh, what I told you, uh, different uh, types uh, of, uh, of a combined uh, treatment. And uh, you can have the, the epiglottic fold section and the lateral uh, epiglottoplasty on this one. Or arytenoid debulking and uh, are epiglottic fold section. OK. So here is an example of, um, of uh, uh, epiglotto uh, pexy with a notch. Uh, and you can see, and well, I don't perform it, but uh, you can uh, perform a stitch from the neck uh, through the epiglottis and put a notch just under the skin. And it seems to work quite well, but I don't have the experience on this. Uh, what you have to uh, keep in mind also in the end, it's a complication of the surgery because ev every surgery could be complicated. Um, in short term, you, you may not improve completely the child. So he, will have, he could have feeding difficulties and need for gastric tube in the end of the surgery. He could have aspiration, especially in case of neurological disease. And he could have also breathing difficulties or partial improvement or no improvement at all. Uh, usually, I told you, I think they have, uh, neuro when they have neurological uh, disease, uh, they, they have much more uh, pathological complications after, uh, not complications, but they, they don't have uh, great improvement after the surgery. And in long term, uh, what is important, uh, and you have to keep in mind when you are performing the surgery, the worst thing that could happen to you is a supraglottic stenosis and the, and the synesia. And so you have to be very, very careful about using uh, uh, the laser, especially between the arytenoids. And, you, well, I, and uh, if you perform an arytenoidoplasty with a laser, uh, it, you can use it, but you have to be very, very lateral and especially never on, on, the, on the medial part of the larynx because it, it could lead to a supraglottic stenosis. The, the stenosis that have been reported uh, in the literature were about uh, um, the, the laser, the old ones, and it was for cutting the epiglottic folds. And how to prevent them? Well, uh, you have to use uh, wisely the tools that you have in the operating room. Uh, you can give some post-operative medical treatment, anti-reflux and steroids. Uh, you can avoid re-intervention uh, if the child is not improving and you can use the non-invasive uh, ventilation. And uh, do not uh, uh, perform large mucosal resection. And um, if you, if you want to uh, have some uh, arytenoblasty, you do not perform the mucosal vaporization sorry, in the arytenoid notch. And uh, you have to be reasonable with the expectations, especially if the patients have uh, uh, great comorbidities. I really thank you for your attention. I hope that I've been clear. I'm pretty sure that we are on time. And uh, I saw that you wrote down some questions, but I don't know when you want to answer it, uh, uh, Shazia. I will share, 
I will stop the sharing of my screen. Um, thank you, Briac. You're welcome. I just wonder if, um, Louisa, should we do some questions now? Uh, maybe just to answer the ones that are in the chat? Louisa? We've lost Louisa. Um, I think so, Shazia. We had quite a few questions just after that um, section, if that's okay. Um, I don't know if you want me to quickly just mention what the questions were. Yeah, I can just ask you one question with your Sorry, thumb. Shaza, did you want me to mention what the questions were? Yes, please. Yeah, before you start with the epiglotto, the epiglottoplasty, when you um, cauterize the uh, the laryngeal, the lingual surface of the epiglottis, what sort of settings are you using for that? For the epiglottoplasty? Yeah. Yes, I'm using the, the, the French laser that, is, that everyone has has talked about, which is a Tullium laser. And uh, I use it at uh, five watts and um, I avoiding, and I try not to go uh, over 20 uh, joules because after I think it's too much and we'll have some thermal injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is how we performed for, uh, the, this is what I showed you on the, the epiglottoplasty uh, uh, example. Great. Okay, thank you. And um, I see there are quite a few questions. Louisa, I'm going to let you go ahead. Um, I, I'm really. Hi, Shaza. Yes, thanks. Um, there are. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm reading. Sorry, go ahead, Bria. Yes, I'm reading a few of them. So uh, one, uh, one of uh, the, the question is when you will consider the child for a flexible laryngoscopic examination. So I think we can we, we kind of uh, answer this one. Um, uh, it depends who you are. If you are a pediatrician, or if you are an ENT, if you are an ENT, and if, and if you see as an ENT, a pediatric ENT, a child with a with a strider in your consultation, I'm pretty sure you are going to perform a flexible. But if you are a pediatrician, if the child just has a strider with just mild symptoms, maybe it's wise not to send him to the ENT because maybe he doesn't need it. Okay, this is one of the the answer I can give. Um, oh, the, the, there's a question just under, which is very interesting. Which cases other than laryngomalacia do you go under vocal folds and how to avoid laryngospasm? Uh, alors, in consultation, I'm performing uh, flexible in an awake children and I never, never, ever, ever go under the vocal folds during the consultation because you could have a laryngospasm. If I need to check something which is under the vocal folds, I will go to the surgery room and I will perform an endoscopy with general anesthesia. So there is no other case and there is no case uh, to go under the vocal folds in, the con in consultation. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. Um, uh, what anesthesia technique do you, did you use in that video? Uh, um, uh, it's, I'm sorry for this, uh, it's um, because I don't know the name in English for this. Uh, we use Rémi Fentanyl and Propofol. Yes. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, it's the same. So it's uh, intravenous uh, anesthesia, Propofol in yes. Rémi, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. So in intravenous drugs, Propofol and uh, Rémi Fentanyl. And we also, so uh, it's... Uh, it's 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 quite uh, it's it's quite a frequent job for the anesthesiologist uh, in the in the endoscopic uh, um, uh, laryngoscopy, and uh, we also add to this something to improve the ventilation. So it could be uh, a nasal tube uh, with uh, oxygen, or it could be the OptiFlow uh, to uh, to improve uh, uh, ventilation and avoiding uh, desaturation during this. And uh, we, I think we, start, we started using uh, um, uh, OptiFlow like uh, three years ago, and we definitely saw a difference uh, 
before and after. And since we are using it, we, 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 we have uh, endoscopy, um, which are going very, very well. Maybe just a minute about what is OptiFlow for people. Um, um, yes, and uh, OptiFlow is a high, um, um, it's, a, it's a transnasal um, high. Like, like, like Thrive? Yes, the exactly. Thank you very much. High flow. This is the word I was looking for. Yes. C'est bien. Okay. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Okay. There are a few other questions, uh, Louisa, before we move on, how much time do we have just to answer one or two? I think that's it, actually. Somebody suggested a cobalation wand instead of laser. Yes. I like that. Yes, definitely you can use the cobalation. The reason why I don't use it is because I think it's very, very expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think one probe is about 150 euros. So it could be something like uh, $200. And uh, I think it's a waste of money uh, as I have the uh, multi-use laser tips. Uh, and I don't want to use uh, the cobalator because it's too expensive. This is the reason why. Sounds good. I think that's it. Uh, we'll probably move on. Thank you very much. So we can have um, more questions. Yes, after Kaza, I think answers if you want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kaza, are you there? I'm. Yes, I am. Um, without further ado, I'm going to move on to the next um, okay. to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Briat. That was lovely. Um, I'm going to just screen share. Can you see that? Excellent. We can see your screen. You can just put it on to a presenter mode. Okay, great. So our next speaker is Titus Zongodza, and I'm uh, very excited to introduce Titus. Titus is um, actually from Zimbabwe. He finished his um, uh, ENT training in 2016 and then went on to um, Australia. And he actually did back-to-back -back fellowships, one in pediatric ENT and in head and neck and then returned uh, home. And he set up um, a pediatric ENT service in Zimbabwe. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm gonna have Titus do his talk about an African perspective on Laringo Malaysia. And I must say, Titus is a rising star in Africa and together we're forging ahead with Paint Africa and, um, and trying to spread the um, message of uh, pediatric ENT services across the continent. So um, I'm thrilled to have Titus do this talk to um, speak truth from our side. So go ahead, um, Titus, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Shazia, for the nice introduction. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. All right. And thanks to the IFOS team for organizing this uh, very nice um, um, seminar. Uh, my talk is going to be on Laringo Malaysia, and I'm going to focus more on the Zimbabwean experience, or I call it rather the African experience. Uh, thanks so much, Brack, for the uh, presentation earlier on. I think it highlighted quite a lot of um, things that I will discuss uh, with the team today. Um, so I'll just a brief introduction for where, where I'm working from. Zimbabwe is in the southern part of Africa, just north of South Africa. Um, in terms of population, we are about 16.5 million. And uh, like any other country in Africa, we have a very big uh, population of the um, pediatric uh, age group. So about zero to 14, uh, about 40% 40 of our population is below 14 years of age. And we, are, we have a very high birth rate of about 34 births per 1,000 people. And we face quite a lot of uh, health issues, 
uh, of late being the COVID, but we have a, about 13% average HIV prevalence rate. And this can be confounded by uh, TB and malnutrition. So this um, um, graph here just shows how our, our population is dis distributed. As you can see with a very large belly in the um, pediatric as well as young um, adulthood group. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Titus. Sorry, my screen has just frozen. Let me see if I can play the next slide. No problem. I'm just going to stop yes, sharing. Yes, well, perhaps just go one slide back and then um, try again. Sorry, my slides can't play here. Uh, let me just see if I can fix this. You may be able to just stop sharing the screen and then reshare it perhaps. Sure. Let me see if I can do that. Is it possible to do it from your end? Have you uploaded them across to the um yes the sure I, yeah i can get them quickly Um, that seemed to have worked. I um, did see you move back a slide. Yes. Uh, so I, I hope uh, everybody can hear me now. I beg your pardon, Tajas. Yeah, can you hear me now? Can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. So for those ones who are interested in tourism, we are a very rich, uh, tourist rich country with uh, Victoria Falls, uh, Great Zimbabwe, uh, Matopos, and you can see all the big five uh, animals that um, we talk about. In terms of our population, about 30% is urban, then the majority is uh, rural, forming about 67%. We have a very big variation in terms of um, our, our demographics from the rich people to the poorest of the people. And for the rural communities, we often see problems with water and sanitation, as well as malnutrition being quite rampant. So I will not go through this. I think Briac has mentioned it uh, to detail. But what I would like to, to mention is that for uh, our African setting and for our children, we usually put a lot of emphasis on uh, growth monitoring, as this is one of the parameters that most of the pediatricians uh, look at, uh, mainly following up the malnutrition side. But as of the ENT side, um, in terms of Aringo Malaysia monitoring, it forms one of the uh, fundamentals uh, is growth monitoring or growth filtering is one of the common presentations. In addition to this stride, we also see aspiration, cyanosis, uh, recurrent pneumonias. And in our setting, particularly, we also see children who have uh, quite severe cardiac disease uh, in the form of copalmonale from um, the um, its effects of um, uh, laryngomalacia. And um, as shown on my slide there, um, there is uh, inward collapse of the uh, epiglottis um, and the causes like Briac has mentioned, uh, three main, main causes, weakness, poor neuromuscular control, uh, also a combination of the two as well as uh, reflux.
So in terms of uh, differ differential diagnosis, um, in our population, we see about 10% of the patients having uh, multiple comorbidities. Um, some of the things that uh, we discussed uh, in Bragg's presentation include um, exclusion of other causes of uh, pediatric stridor. I will put particular emphasis on uh, laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy uh, in a child that we are taking to surgery for or to theater for laryngomalacia. Uh, full assessment of the airway uh, is usually needed as other competing comorbidities such as tracheomalacia is shown in my uh, first picture there, which is essentially anterior posterior collapse of the uh, tracheal cartilages uh, from weakness of the wall. And you can also see bronchomalacia is shown in my um, middle picture. And the third picture is the uh, recent um, laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy picture of a child that we did uh, supraglottoplast in the last uh, weeks. So in the, in the clinic, uh, flexible uh, laryngoscopy for the moderate to severe case, cases is quite uh, important as a diagnostic tool. As you can see in the, in the picture uh, above of a child that we recently um, managed, you can see collapse of the um, early epiglottic folds with uh, the killed epiglottis as well. Um, and I would like to emphasize uh, that with flexible laryngoscopy, our um, limit is actually the focal cords. And like Brack has mentioned, I'll just reiterate that um, going beyond the focal cords is only for um, cases that we uh, take to theater as you can um, potentially um, cause severe laryngospasm and you might end up losing the patient in clinic. And the uh, video which is playing is showing the uh, inward collapse of the early epiglottic folds in a child who is uh, under general anesthesia. Again, uh, Brian has mentioned this and type one, again, you can see the collapse of the uh, area epiglottic uh, folds and type two combination of the collapse plus the tubular epiglottis as well as type three, which forms the uh, epiglottic collapse. So in regards to management, um, Africa presents a very difficult um, um, management um, uh, scenario because we often find we don't have the full multidisciplinary team, which involves the pediatrician, the uh, pediatric otolaryngologist, the speech and swallow therapy, and um, um, the dietitian as well. But what we often find is in any setting, we, 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 we usually try and gather the minimum uh, team that we can have. And in Zimbabwe, for example, we, the minimum is the pediatrician, the ENT surgeon, as well as the uh, speech and swallow evaluation. Those three um, colleagues form a very important part of the um, uh, laryngomalacia assessment. And in some cases, we also do endoscopic evaluation of um, a swallow together with the speech pathologist. And with this, we can have an idea of, of um, how to, um, what's the texture of the food that we can feed and how best to feed. And again, in the African setting, we often see um, limited resources in terms of additional feeding. As for Zimbabwe, our commonest method of uh, feeding is actually um, breastfeeding. And when you try and introduce something else to, um, to the uh, diet for these children, you often find you eat brickles because of the um, poverty. But majority of the time, we get away with um, some form of um, breastfeeding. And then, like I said, we put quite strong emphasis on growth monitoring. Any child with moderate to severe laryngomalacia, our recommendations are weekly weights uh, for about one to two months, depending on when we'd want to intervene. If the child affords us in two to three consecutive weeks uh, or loses weight in two to three consecutive weeks, then we always consider uh, moving a step further to, uh, to surgery. And acid suppression for the moderate to severe cases, we always uh, try and um, um, use acid suppression. And again, with uh, we tailor make our acid suppression with the weight of the child. If the child gains weight, we always involve our pediatrician in the prescriptions for, for the acid suppression. And in addition to this, we usually every two to three weeks when we see these patients, we uh, encourage them, the speech pathologist to have an assessment as well as to what they can feed and the dietitian to try and tailor make the, the, the requirements for these children. 
in regards to surgery, um, because of the different hospitals that I work in, we often find different um, uh, setup in terms of equipment, but the basic um, uh, laryngoscopy or panendoscopy uh, set for the children is actually the uh, Myos table, which I've just, uh, which you can see in this picture, and the tower, as well as different uh, types of laryngoscopes, as well as different types of uh, uh, endotracheal tubes. And uh, in terms of airway assessment, uh, a marking touch laryngoscope is shown in the in the diagram in the picture there, together with a zero degree uh, four four millimeter scope, is what we usually use. Topicalization of the airway, we routinely do it with uh, uh, lignocaine uh, as well as with adrena adrenaline. And in terms of the anesthesia, uh, the most favorable one is Thrive, but in some cases we often use the uh, nasopharyngeal airway um, or an an endotracheal tube in the nasopharynx or an oropharyngeal endotracheal tube together with um, uh, the remifentanil and propofol as discussed in the last uh, picture. And in terms of occlusion, exclusion of differential diagnosis, um, this is essential in, uh, sorry. This is essential in our um, assessment. As you can see in this uh, image here, a video of a child that we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, we always assess uh, the focal cord mobility. In this child, there was the child was in, in apnea. As you can see, this is um, bronchoscopy. For bronchoscopy, we would like to rule other things like um, complete rings, bronchomalacia. Or tracheal stenosis. And in terms of uh, laryngomalacia surgery, I would like to reiterate, like Briac has mentioned before, in my in my hands, uh, I use cord steel. I just want to compare this. Uh, this is one of the cases that I did when I was doing my fellowship with um, uh, use of the laser. And on my left hand side is the picture that we are using cord steel. Again, in terms of differences, the, the, there isn't much difference in terms of uh, the outcomes of cord steel versus laser, but you find laser is a bit more precise. But again, in terms of um, complications, um, additions as well as um, bends are quite common with laser. And you also need special uh, equipment, which is usually not available in my, in my um, setting. Again, this was mentioned in the last slide, and in the I just want to mention in the uh, in in picture B, which is the middle uh, picture, you can see part of the epiglottis was also shifted away um, to um, open up the uh, airway. This is often what what we do in the event of a combination of early epiglottic collapse as well as epiglottic collapse. Again, in terms of results and equipment. Um, I think the most important thing for uh, surgeons in uh, low resource, uh, resource settings is to be able to do a surgery in a safe way uh, with the minimum equipment to achieve uh, the best results for our children because we often find um, um, equipment issues being quite a big uh, problem in most of these settings. So as long as we keep safe and make sure that we do the, the um, minimum essential surgery for these cases, we should be able to get very good uh, results. And in terms of results, if you can um, compare the first picture there with the um, last picture, what's more important, what I just wanted to highlight here is to try and avoid working in the interarytenoid region as shown in the uh, first image to the left and as well as uh, the last image to the right, and also partial uh, resection of the lateral folds of the epiglottis, which often collapse in um, uh, laryngomalacia, especially the type two. Sorry, my, my slides keep, ju keep jumping, but I should be able to resolve this. So in terms of um, um, 
special circumstances. Again, we often find in some clinics, especially resource limited settings, we often find the there is not a there is not a flexible a laryngoscopy either the flexible laryngoscopy is too big or you cannot use it either too small or it's broken i would say in that scenario in cases where the child is um, suspected um, moderate to severe laryngomalacia it's often important to take the children for um, examination under anesthesia um, to exclude other airway comorbidities as well as to confirm uh, or refute the differential diagnosis of um, uh, laryngomalacia. And one more important thing is for um, resource limited settings as well, use of a myo table uh, and instead of a compression of the chest is very important uh, and that will uh, improve uh, the oxygenation levels and make the anesthesia a bit easy to, to give. Then the uh, third scenario is for the five to 10% of the cases who may fail to improve uh, despite uh, conventional uh, supraglottoplasty. These are children that we have to consider for a possible um, um, tracheostomy and or feeding gastrostomy. Again, in resource limited settings, it's a decision that you have to um, consider uh, carefully as because the management of tracheostomy is not as straightforward in the uh, um, resource limited settings because the tracheostomy tubes are not available the suction uh, machines are not available or you need a solar driven or a manual uh, suction catheter. And you're also dealing with uh, parents who might not be well educated to be able to take care of this um, child in the um, rural areas and issues with uh, transport in the event of uh, tracheal tube blockage have to be considered when you, when you consider um, uh, tracheo, uh, tracheostomy as a form of uh, treatment for laryng laryngomalacia. What's more important pre-operatively as well as post-operatively in uh, my setting is use of acid reflux, weight monitoring, and use of uh, perioperative uh, steroids. But I would like to say and believe that with uh, surgeons in Africa, this is something that is possible to do, but we need to make sure that we are um, extra vigilant in terms of how safe the child may be uh, intraoperatively as well as post-operatively, given the a minimum um, set of personnel as well as minimum set of um, equipment available for us to use. I think this, uh, this is everything that I prepared. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Titus. Well done. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm going to hand over to to Prof. Peer. Um, I just want to see, there were one or two questions on the chat function, which I think have already been addressed, one of which was the dose um, of the um, PPIs. Um, I think the consensus is um, osomoprazole or lansoprazole at one milligram per kg. There was just one question, um, Dr. Titus, I don't know if you'd be happy to just take this on, uh, just a question with regards to your experience in access to the larynx when you use oral or nasal intubation. Mm -hmm. Well, if using the, the technique that we use, we start with uh, normal um, um, transoral intubation. Then once we are ready with our equipment, we remove the tubes. Once you pull out the tube, uh, most of the time you leave it in the, in the oropharynx and make sure that the bevel end is not um, facing posteriorly so that you can be able to deliver um, uh, air into the, um, into the larynx. That usually works quite well. But as a backup measure, we usually put another um, tube uh, in the, um, through the nose transnasally. We can also use to ventilate. And during the procedure, we, also, we, we use, um, we intubate and extubate depending on the uh, monitoring of the saturations. So it's quite a feasible uh, technique as long as you monitor the end of your endotracheal tube uh, so that it's not facing posteriorly or holding onto some tissue. Uh, when it's in the oropharynx. And also take note that you might also have some blood clots trickling down into the oropharynx onto your endotracheal tube, but it's quite a feasible and easier method of uh, ventilation in the absence of uh, Thrive. Excellent, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, so we, for this portion of our presentation, we've um, covered our big topic of Laringa Malaysia. We're now going to move on to the second part of our, of our webinar. I'm gonna ask Prof. Pierre if she wouldn't mind to just introduce us to um, our next section, which is autoendoscopy. Prof. Pierre. Um, thank you very much, Louisa. Um, 
Actually, I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, my co-chair, Francois Simon, who is an otologist also at Necker Hospital um, in Paris. And Francois, if you would like to introduce our next speaker, who I'm also very thrilled to have um, speaking to us today. Hi, Shazia. Um, thank you very much. Dr. Titus, can I just ask that you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah, it's just frozen. Let me see if I can allow you to uh, remote control my computer. So, stop sharing. Stop. Well, in any case, during this uh, little technical um, technicality, I wanted to thank everybody for this fantastic first uh, webinar. And as uh, Shazia said, it's the first of three for the moment, which we have planned. And uh, for the moment, everything is really, is really going well. So we're going to uh, move on from the laryngomalacia and uh, move up in the body to the, uh, to the middle ear. And so our, our, you can try and uh, pause for, uh, stop sharing for me. I'm sure you can control my, my screen from there. Okay, well, um, sure. Uh, Louisa, do you want to see if you can? Um... Okay, let me see if I can. Sorry, Francois, you go ahead. No problem. So the next uh, speaker will be Adrian James. And so I'm really, uh, I think we all are very honored that uh, Adrian has accepted to participate to this uh, first UI first webinar. It's really fantastic to, to have you here with us. So a quick presentation. So Adrian James is a professor in pediatric otolaryngology at the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, he works at the hospital for sick children in uh, Toronto and predominantly on otologic uh, issues. And uh, amongst other things, he has a great experience in uh, autoendoscopy uh, in chronic middle ear disease. So uh, Adrian has always, already made many presentations on autoendoscopy, uh, multiple presentations at congresses and webinars. And so we're very lucky to have you uh, share this with us now. So now, um, without further ado, can, uh, on to you, Adrian. Uh, well, thank you very much, Francoise, and, and, and thank you, Shazia, also for this uh, kind invitation. In fact, um, the opportunity to, I'm very flattered to be asked to speak at uh, Young IFOS. Uh, uh, it's making me feel younger already. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm happy to see there are a couple of uh, uh, friends in the audience. I noticed uh, uh, Dr. Chayo Pass from Thailand and um, uh, my old friend, Dr. Ranjan Ray Chowdhury, uh, who's uh, from Calcutta, as well as uh, you and Shazir. The wider, the wider community. Uh, and I'm going to, um, uh, because of the audience that I'm speaking to, I was thinking that perhaps uh, many of you uh, will not have had much opportunity to practice endoscopic surgery, uh, but that you might be interested in doing so in the ear. Uh, and so my talk is really going to focus at the level of people who might be interested in getting started. Um, before I go on, I want to pay tribute to who was a, an inspiration to me. This is a picture of him in a, uh, before I think he got so much into uh, ear surgery, climbing in his native home of South Africa. He was an early professional climber. Uh, he um, was one of the pioneers of totally endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, and when he came to Toronto as a, as a fellow, uh, he uh, inspired me um, to, uh, to, to start taking up totally endoscopic ear surgery myself. And so I think um, he sadly died a, a, a couple of years ago from a, from a brain which saddens us all still. But I think perhaps he can be an inspiration to those of you uh, young uh, otologists in the audience uh, that you too may be able to inspire your older colleagues to adopt this technique. And it's very important to, oh, sorry, I was thinking I had another slide next, but yeah, so, so basically uh, this is what I'm gonna be, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, first of all, uh, why would you want to do totally endoscopic ear surgery? What, what are the benefits? And then having gone through that, uh, then talk about what kind of equipment you might need and, what, uh, and give you some uh, surgical tips on how you might get started. Uh, so uh, but bef bef before I go any further, what I wanted to point out is that there are two ways that we can use endoscopes in the ear. 
One is an adjunct to uh, microscope guided surgery or open surgery, where we might put an endoscope in through a post auricular incision. And this was what really what was originally described by uh, Jean-Marc Thomasson back in the uh, 90s, uh, where he used endoscopes to good effect to help reveal uh, residual remnants of cholestetoma and improve his cholestetoma surgery outcomes. But the, the reason why endoscopes have become of greater interest in the last decade or so is because of uh, the, the fact that they can be used for a much more minimally invasive approach uh, with a totally endoscopic trans-canal technique. So really that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And the reason why we uh, are so interested is because of the better view that we get with an endoscope. Uh, and uh, it's kind of shown here schematically by uh, uh, these, this original drawing by uh, Muaz Tarabici, um, showing that the wired field of view that you can get by passing the lens of the endoscope through the narrowest point of the ear canal. There are some people, and this, this diagram comes from uh, the work of Mario Sanna's group in, in, uh, in Italy, who maintain that you, if you drill a little bit of bone away, you can see just as well with a microscope. Uh, but of course, with an angled endoscope, you can see around the corner into hidden recesses, which is more difficult to do with a microscopic view. Uh, and I like to use this bit of video, of, which is actually from uh, a hilltop castle in Italy. If you want to take a picture of this tree, uh, you don't uh, hold your camera way out, outside beyond the narrow point. You put your camera beyond the narrow point so you can see the tree properly. And if you want to see around the corner, you don't make a hole in the wall. You, you just change the angle of your camera. And so I think this is a very useful metaphor for understanding the advantage of using an endoscope for mid-ear surgery. Uh, you can see it more uh, relevantly, if you like, with, the, with this video, trying to get the best view we can with a speculum through the ear canal with a microscope. Uh, even when you move the, the speculum around, you still have a very limited view compared with the complete view of the uh, uh, entire middle ear space, really, or the entire area where the eardrum would be uh, with an endoscope. And when we apply that to our uh, surgery, uh, you'll see how this works in practice. So this is an old bit of video from a, a second look uh, tympanomastoidectomy in a right ear. And I wanted to inspect the retro tympanum for signs of residual disease. And I was taught to put a bit of saline in the ear and look in the meniscus. And you can see when we do that, uh, that there is a little bit of uh, residual disease somewhere in the retro tympanum here. Uh, and the other thing I was taught to do was to use a mirror, and you can see it much more clearly with the mirror than you can with uh, putting saline in the ear, but you've still got the problem as how you're going to remove it. If you're holding the mirror in one hand, it's going to be difficult to, uh, to, to resect that uh, surgically with the other. If we put an endoscope in the ear, and I think this is an old 30 degree endoscope, uh, we can see the lesion much more clearly, uh, and this provides a much more uh, easy opportunity for us to remove the disease. So that's using an endoscope to look really for remnants uh, after previous surgery, but more appropriate is to use the endoscope to see uh, directly while we're removing the disease. So these bits of video are from the same patient in, sorry, in the uh, uh, retro tympanum with the microscope, it's not possible to see anything. The instruments disappear out of sight. This is the round window niche here, uh, and uh, we really can't see very much at all of what's going on. Uh, with the endoscopic view, the round window niche is at the, the front of the field almost. We can see the entire retro tympanum very clearly, and so we're able to dissect the skin off the um, uh, out of the recess here under direct vision and make sure that we don't leave any behind. Uh, and so we now have data to, to show that this technique is effective. Uh, one of our um, bright young residents, Peter Dixon, did a propensity score analysis, which is a fancy way of doing a match pair analysis, comparing uh, outcomes from surgery for cholestetoma confined to the, the middle ear and attic uh, when using a, a totally endoscopic approach or a post-auricular approach. And it's important to note that in the post-auricular approach, uh, I did uh, in some cases have access to use an endoscope for the surgery if I wanted to. Really the aim of this, this, this study was to see if having access to a two-handed approach uh, reduced the risk of residual disease, but clearly it didn't. With the one-handed endoscopic approach, um, results were at least as good as um, the, the residual disease rate was, was um, appeared to be better than uh, 
than with the post directed approach. This, now, this with this with this number of patients, 128 patients, there wasn't statistical significance. But when uh, we add these results to a recent uh, meta analysis, uh, you can see that uh, others uh, also failed really to achieve significance. But when we put all our results together with a decent number of patients, we do see that there's a statistically significant difference in the risk of residual cholesteatoma when we do totally endoscopic surgery. When it comes to other outcomes, uh, surgical outcomes, like closing a tympanic membrane perforation, uh, the results aren't really uh, any different, actually. In my hands, uh, the success rate in this older publication, and, and looking at my more uh, up-to-date numbers, the success rate is pretty much the same, whether I do it totally endoscopically or post uh at around 85%. Uh, for, for closing the perforation. And, and there are a few meta-analyses now that look that pool other people's data and come to the same conclusion. So there's not really much benefit in terms of closing uh, perforation. And similarly, when we look at uh, acicloplasty results, and our, our results are going to be published soon, and other uh, groups of surgeons have, have published their results, showing that uh, when we do total acicular replacement prosthesis acicloplasty, uh, the results are no uh, no better or no worse. So again, the two-handed approach, uh, although it might be a little bit easier to position a prosthesis with two hands, uh, the results turn out don't turn out to be any better um, with either technique. So you might be beginning to think, well, if the results aren't you know that clearly better, why why would we do uh, the endoscopic uh, approach? Because it is more difficult. We have to do the surgery just with one hand, and and that does make it difficult at times. And the real reason is because, uh, in my opinion anyway, is that because the morbidity is less when we do surgery through the ear canal, uh, particularly when we compare it with a posterior incision. And, um, you know, we don't, most cases don't get any complications from posterior surgery. But from my, when I look back at my data, 4% of patients did have some sort of complication, uh, whether it was a seroma or a dehiscence. Um, and many people, I would ask actually, if you are going to do postauricular surgery, I'd strongly recommend do not use interrupted sutures, but use a subcuticular incision so that you avoid a nasty scar uh, like this one. And then occasionally, of course, we get uh, um, the feared complication of a keloid. Uh, and this is not just in the darkest uh, skin patients. Uh, people from all parts of the world can get uh, can get keloids, uh, and uh, that's a devastating complication from um, from uh, from a posterior approach, uh, or we might end up with a fistula into the mastoid like this one. So these are all things that can happen after posterior surgery, albeit rarely. When we look at our data and others, we see that there are other benefits. The surgery ends up being quicker. I can do a uh, um, with a bit of practice, I can now do uh, an endoscopic tympanoplasty in just over half an hour, where it, the quickest I could do it post auricularly was, was 45 minutes. So we save a bit of OR time. Uh, there's less pain, there's less requirement for opiates postoperatively. The length of stay in hospital consequently is shorter. Uh, and these factors, shorter length of stay and shorter surgery, are very popular with the hospital because it, um, um, of course, uh, uh, makes things more economically viable. But the biggest, oh, sorry, my computer's just fallen over. Are you still, uh, are you still there? Yes, we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, okay. the, um, the biggest, and that's actually, that's a good time to pause for emphasis, in fact, because the biggest driver for me for doing uh, totally endoscopic surgery in my pediatric practice is that parents greatly prefer it if their child uh, avoids an incision. And it's hard to um, overemphasize really how important it is for the parents. To us, a little incision behind the ear doesn't seem like a big deal, but for families and their kids, it, it means a lot to them to avoid that incision. Um, this is uh, so, so we have these um, benefits of um, more effective cholesteatoma removal. Although perforation closure and hearing results are similar, there's definitely less morbidity when using a transcanal approach. And our um, friends in uh, Sydney, uh, Nermal Patel, showed at least in an Australian model that you can demonstrate uh, cost effectiveness by uh, doing surgery totally endoscopically rather than using an open microscope guided approach. And I think this, seeing as we're looking, seeing as we have a, an international audience, and we, we've just heard a great talk about the uh, um, practicalities of doing laryngomalacia surgery in Zimbabwe. 
um, in parts of the world where access to care is restricted, I think uh, the totally endoscopic approach is going to be much more feasible uh, than trying to do a microscope guided approach. I um, vividly remember um, a talk at the first um, Endoscopic World Congress, which was a long time ago, it must have been 10 years ago or so now, by um, uh, a doctor from Kenya, I think it was Dr. Chimi Omamu Alende, who gave a very nice presentation of how she could do totally endoscopic ear surgery off her laptop with a camera and portable light source uh, and use that as a, in a, in a, um, to, to, to operate in, in, uh, in areas where um, hospital facilities were restricted. So definitely uh, an, an opportunity uh, internationally to use this technique. Uh, I would say, I think we, also, we don't talk enough about sustainability uh, and trying to reduce our impact on the environment of our surgery. At the end of an operation, we uh, uh, throw away a lot of, it's embarrassing actually how much we throw away at the end of a surgery uh, in our uh, operating room and probably in others too. Uh, this bag here represents the um, disposable items that are required when we do a microscope guided approach, including things like the microscope drape and the uh, cautery and the bandages and the sutures and the scalpels, obviously not the blades in here. Uh, and this weighs a kilogram. So with one, and it costs about 50 or $60 to buy this, uh, what ends up being garbage. So uh, that's all waste. And by the end, by the end of an operating list, uh, we maybe have this much. Uh, by the end of a, a month, we might have this much. And by the end of a year, we probably, put, who knows how much uh, unnecessary plastic waste we generated uh, by um, using equipment that we don't need. Uh, and uh, so I've a, I'm able to save quite a lot by doing surgery endoscopically. Uh, probably most of it gets incinerated and turned into carbon dioxide, but that which doesn't maybe ends up on a beach near you. Uh, and so um, perhaps more important than whether we do surgery endoscopically or not, uh, is how we uh, reduce our footprint on the environment. But anyway, that's uh, perhaps too much of an aside. If we uh, get back to the, the topic of, uh, that I was asked to talk about of endoscopic ear surgery, let's assume that we're convinced that the benefits are worth it for our patients and it's something we get, want to get into. How do we get started? And um, normally, um, in the pre-pandemic world, I would have said, go somewhere uh, where you can uh, do a course and learn how to do it uh, in, in, on models and, and maybe watch some live surgery. Uh, that's a more, bit more difficult at the moment, but maybe as I'll show you, maybe we can set up our own training models and watch surgical videos online and perhaps get started uh, carefully without a course. So I'll talk about how we get trained and then what equipment we may need uh, to, uh, to get going. And um, for some of us, we have access to 3D printed models uh, and we can do this in our hospital. So you don't need a, a special lab, you can do it in your office. One of our uh, trainees here wanted to practice putting in a, a graph material. So he did that in the office on a printed temporal bone. To be honest, it's not a great model. You really need a, a, a cartilaginous meatus as well. Uh, and so this, this picture comes from Seiji Kakahata's course in Japan. Uh, and they have put a lot of time and money into um, building very high fidelity um, models. You can see the, 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 the ossicles very clearly in this print-in model, uh, which is, of course, um, parts of it can be reused uh, and they have a kind of silastic ear which cushions the endoscope and make, gives a more realistic feel. So that um, is great in settings where you don't have access to a wet lab or cadaveric material uh, but there are some limitations and I think the difficult thing to practice really is the soft tissue handling. So if you can it's better to use a, a cadaveric head uh, and it's much better to use fresh frozen material, fresh or frozen material rather than formalized material because the formalin stiffens the soft tissue, so it gives a very unrealistic feel for endoscopic surgery. Um, our um, friends in Italy, um, um, Marco Bonali was the lead behind this work, have used the sheep, um, sheep heads to, to good effect, so they find that very effective. Uh, we're not allowed to use that here for various reasons. So we've recently done a course for our residents with goat heads. Uh, and so I think many of you around the world might be able to access these materials. Human, the trouble with human heads, although of course they're a perfect model, 
uh, they're very expensive for most of us and difficult to get hold of. Uh, so not really feasible for residency teaching in our program. So uh, we use this GOAT model and here you can see that, that it's a left ear, the malleus handle here, the chorda tympani, facial nerve coming around here, trying to position an acicloplasty. The anatomy is a bit weird and different, but it's close enough that it makes a good training model. So uh, I do think if you do get the opportunity to use the endoscope in simulation first, that's obviously ideal. If not, then uh, you're just going to have to start gradually and carefully. Uh, and you may use endoscopes as, a, as an assistant to a microscope guided approach first before you try and do surgery totally endoscopically. Uh, but when you are um, graduating into totally endoscopic ear surgery in a patient, uh, and this is true whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're teaching uh, trainees yourself, it's very important to think of a graded, uh, a sort of hierarchical approach to, to risk. Uh, and I initially used to think, well, uh, we should start with the safe, easy things and then progressively move to the riskier and, and, and more difficult things. But what I realized after a while is actually it's a good idea to start with difficult things if they're safe, as long as there's low risk to the patient. If you practice difficult things, then the easier things turn out to be even easier. An example of that is actually trimming the hairs because the, we, we need to trim the hairs of the external auditory meatus so we can see clearly. It's quite difficult to balance the endoscope near the outside of the ear and trim the hairs. So that can be quite a tricky thing to do, but it's a great thing to practice. Uh, and then we progress to uh, more difficult things. Well, elevating the skin flap is actually uh, fairly safe. Uh, and then when you've mastered that, then elevating the annulus um, is maybe the next step. I put making the incision down here because um, I want to be sure that the incision in the ear canal is in the right place. And uh, uh, when people are starting, they don't necessarily have a good feel for that. So I normally do a few cases with the trainee before I let them make the incision. And then ultimately, um, I won't let people operate in the middle ear space until they've demonstrated um, capability with this. And ideally, the first time they work in the middle ear, the, the stapes will have been eroded previously. And then the next time, if they're safe with this, I might let them operate with a stapes, but no incus. This hierarchical approach has been, um, oh, actually, and I wanted to say, while we may move progressively towards harder things, of course, there are some things which are going to be too difficult and too risky for any of us to do. So you shouldn't feel that you can push it and, and um, um, do more and more dangerous things. There's always going to be a limit for all of us as to what's too risky. But ultimately, uh, I think uh, uh, dissecting uh, matrix off a dehiscent foot plate is perfectly uh, feasible with an endoscopic approach once you've got used to it. This, um, and if you want to read more about it, this hierarchical approach to training has been described in more detail by, um, uh, by the group from Modena and Verona in, uh, in Italy. So uh, one uh, question that people always want to ask about is how do we set up the operating room? And I put these pictures of... Yeah, but look, he moved. He was there, he moved. I think somebody's got there. Somebody might like to turn their microphone off unless there's a question I'm happy to answer. I've just um, to okay, thanks. <laughs> so uh, these are young Otto. This is um, Faisal Zawawi, a, a young uh, otolaryngologist in Saudi Arabia. And this is Tukasa Ito, who's um, certainly younger than me, um, I think, uh, working in Japan. The, the point here is that this operating room setup is different around the world and it's different according to what, you know, where your anesthetic machine is, what equipment you have. But the thing that's common for all of us is that the monitor needs to be positioned opposite the surgeon and ideally it needs to be roughly at eye height. In our operating room, we're kind of confined by where the anesthetist is going to be. Uh, we used to have the microscope at the head of the table. Uh, and then the, uh, but, but more recently, uh, I don't really need the microscope for most of my um, middle ear surgery, certainly not for tympanoplasty. So it's no longer in the room. And I actually quite like having the nurse sitting to my, because I'm right handed, uh, we have this set up um, uh, with the nurse to my right side. Uh, but I can imagine. Um, uh, uh, I have a very famous former fellow who was left-handed, who's, <laughs> um, uh, Shazia knows who I'm talking about, 
Uh, and uh, so it's important to recognize that this would not be such a good setup for a left-handed surgeon. Uh, it might be easier if the nurse was standing on this side of the table so that he or she could pass instruments to the surgeon's left hand. Uh, so I think that basically the layout of the room is going to depend on, on the logistics of, 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 what, of what works for you, but make sure that the monitor is at eye height uh, and directly in front of you. Uh, the next question is what kind of equipment do you need and I think everybody realizes I think by now it's it's fairly common knowledge that you don't need to spend a fortune on special equipment in order to get started uh, most people started just with what they had already some some sinus endoscopes and some ordinary middle ear um, instruments but if you are able to get specific equipment a three millimeter and most people find three millimeter endoscopes work the best um, a zero degree endoscope is most useful, followed by a 30 degree and then sometimes 45 degree. A 70 degree endoscope is actually very difficult to use in the ear and, and dangerous in the presence of an intact stapes, but does have a, an occasional role. And for most people, a 14 centimeter scope is the most convenient length, although um, uh, Seiji Kakahata, I mentioned in Japan, uses 2.7 millimeter scopes that I think are 18 centimeters. So different things work for different people. If you are using angled endoscopes, you of course need angled instruments to reach where the endoscope can see. Uh, and there are now commercially available sets uh, for this. I would warn you that some of the commercially available curved suctions are very flexible, which can spring, the kind of springy and bouncy and can bounce off the endoscope into danger. So you need to be very careful of using flexible um, suction cannulae. I would strongly recommend using more rigid uh, suctions. And then ideally, I would, I find particularly helpful to use um, suction to section instruments. And there are, uh, again, there are a few sets of these that are now commercially available. Um, the sets are very expensive and so my suggestion is to to try and persuade the, the 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 distributor to just let you buy the specific instruments that you want than being if you like conned into buying the whole expensive set but if you can't get these it's pretty pretty easy really to make your own from some old suction cannulae or disposable suction cannulae uh, you can bend them a bit uh, file the end off to make it the right shape uh, and uh, we still have some instruments like that that i use that were made uh, when I was a fellow, actually, that we still that we still use sometimes. Uh, and this this bit of video here shows the advantage of using a suction uh, instrument. You can see there's quite a lot of bleeding in the ear canal here, so we really can't see a thing. Uh, but if we use a um, a suction round knife, it keeps the blood clear so that we can see perfectly uh, perfectly well what we're doing. Um, there are some other tricks to help you with bleeding if you don't have access to that kind of uh, instrument. Uh, one is to use cotton balls to soak up the, uh, the blood and to retract for you. Um, uh, topical adrenaline on the cotton ball is, is supposed to help. We, it's safe to use one in a thousand adrenaline uh, on this topical application. You can't eject, inject with that kind of um, strength, but you can certainly apply it topically. And then uh, another trick is to uh, use a third hand. So maybe if your your trainee is struggling uh, with a with the, with the bleeding, uh, you can bring in a suction cannula yourself and, uh, and and clear the blood for them so that they can see a bit better. And even in a child's ear, there's there's usually space to do that. So that's what the kind of equipment that we commonly use and my, my, why we might want to use it. Um, moving on, there are some uh, additional instruments that can be helpful. So if you wanted to do endoscopic transcanal surgery in this ear, you can see that it would be very difficult because, um, well, because of the curvature of the ear canal. Uh, and so using a drill to uh, remove some of that bone can be extremely helpful. Uh, we use a curved burr, which has a, a protected shaft. So it's only the only the the cutting part of the burr that spins, the, the shaft is protected so it doesn't damage the, uh, the skin of the ear canal. Uh, and um, you can see that if the, the bone dust is wet, it kind of forms into a little putty that keeps out the way, but if it dries out, it starts to snow, fly around like a, like a snowstorm. And uh, so it's not, it's not as easy drilling with one hand as it is with two. Uh, nobody's trying to say that one-handed endoscopic ear surgery is easier than, than using two hands and a microscope. Uh, but the point is that it's 
it's possible uh, and we don't need to remove very much bone. It doesn't take that long to alternately uh, wash out and suction to use the drill with an endoscope so that we can then um, get good enough access to do this, tympano this particular tympanoplasty endoscopically. So in this way, I now find that I can do, uh, you know, occasionally I have to do a canal plasty, less often actually than when I used to use a microscope. Um, but I have for several years now, I do 100% of my um, tympanic membrane perforation repairs endoscopically in the, in the ch children that I serve. And that's at any age as well. People often ask about that. Uh, if the, the age is not a barrier to endoscopic ear surgery. So um, that really was kind of a run through of um, some basic tips and the equipment that, that we might need to get started. Uh, and so now maybe we are in a position to do a case. As I say, you might want to start with um, endoscope assisted before you do totally endoscopic ear surgery. Um, and if you could, you would have gone on courses and watched live surgeries to help you. Uh, people are always welcome to come and visit us here if you wish. And I think the same is true for, for, for endoscopic ear surgeons all around the world. They're always happy to, to welcome people to come and watch. Um, so hopefully people will get the chance to do that over the next year or so. But what I've done now is picked a case. And I think, um, Shazia, maybe you can just confirm. I think, have, how much time do I have before we uh, need to stop? I think you've got, you've probably got about, say, seven, even yeah. 10 minutes, if you like. Yeah, okay, so that, that's perfect. So I'll run through this. There, there are a few clips of, thank you, there are a few clips of video here just to run through a case and how we might do it. The case I've picked is a, a, a three-year-old, let's say, a boy with a relatively large congenital cholesteatoma in his uh, left ear, antro superiorly. You can uh, see it there and uh, under here. Um, this might not be the easiest case to pick for a first case. If you want an easy case, I would pick a posteriorly placed um, perforation in a straight ear canal. Um, that would probably be easier. But this is a, a lovely case for an endoscopic approach. So uh, when we start, we have a conversation with our anaesthetist about the requirements for hypotension. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, and I always ask them to try and keep the heart rate under 80 and the systolic blood pressure under 80. Uh, it's not a hard rule. This is anecdote rather than um, science-based, um, but um, very important to keep the heart rate and blood pressure down so that uh, bleeding is minimized. That will make your life very much easier. We typically infiltrate with uh, an adrenaline solution. Maybe uh, we normally use one in 200,000. Uh, with Marcane to infiltrate the ear canal, uh, normally just a single injection, just in the uh, top of the anterior tympanic spine at the boundary between the bony and the cartilaginous meatus. That will often infiltrate the entire canal with one needle poke. Uh, and that, although everybody, well, yeah, we generally say that we think that helps to reduce bleeding, whether it does or not is a bit hard to know for sure, but I think is probably a sensible thing to do. And then while we're waiting for the vasoconstriction to occur, uh, we cut the hairs in the ear canal uh, so that they don't smear against the endoscope. So that's the preparation. Uh, when we made our um, um, meatal skin incision and elevated the uh, um, uh, meatal flap, uh, we then need to uh, elevate the uh, annulus. Uh, and you can see here I'm using a non-suction instrument. This is a, um, a, an old video from probably five years ago or more. And I'm using a cotton ball to retract as well as the, um, um, the, the this uh, dissection instrument. So uh, we can now having, actually another thing I'll point out actually is I just make a hemi-circumferential incision. I don't make any vertical releasing incisions at the end of my incision. Uh, that This 180 degree incision allows me to push the flap forwards out of the way. Uh, and then because there's no uh, vertical incision here, I think it's easier to replace the flap at the end of the surgery. There's less chance of it getting twisted around or disrupted. So now in order to get access to the antro superior quadrant, I'm taking the tympanic membrane off the handle of the malleus. And uh, you, you'll... Uh, uh, appreciate that sharp dissection was necessary. Well, people use different techniques. Oftentimes you'll see people using cup forceps to pull the eardrum down off the malleus, and that's a great thing to do. In order to do that, we'd have needed to make the incision uh, carry on around further anteriorly. 
uh, but my preference was just to make a, an ordinary poster, posteriorly placed incision here. Uh, so now we've elevated the um, drum enough that we can see the cholesterol very well. The, the fibrous layer of the eardrum is still adherent to the, to the umbo here. And uh, in order to release that, we need to use sharp dissection. You need to cut this with scissors in order to release it. And some people worry, will the eardrum go back again afterwards or will it lateralize? And invariably, we find that uh, the drum does stick back down onto the malleus uh, postoperatively. So lateralization of the drum isn't an issue. Uh, and uh, I kind of was exploring the idea here that I might be able to get this thing out in one piece, but you can see it's just much too big to do that. And so what we're going to have to do is to um, incise it uh, and uh, suck out some of the contents so that we can uh, manipulate the uh, um, cholesterol a bit uh, more easily. So that's happened now. And uh, obviously now it's decompressed a bit. I can peel it away from the uh, anterior crust of the stapes here. Uh, we can dissect underneath the malleus handle. And you're probably all aware that the focal point to aim for is the uh, anterior surface of the processus cochleiformis and the anterior surface of the tensor tympani tendon that you can just about see under here because this is where the congenital cholestetoma typically arises from and where it's going to be most firmly attached. Um, the, the disease has now been removed, but I was concerned that there may be a little bit left behind. And so I'm using these uh, angled cut forceps to try and pull that bit of, I don't know if it's matrix or perimatrix off the uh, tendon. Now this is extremely difficult to do. As you can see, my hands are a bit shaky. It's a rather clumsy instrument to use in this location. Uh, I was worried that that was going to tear at the wrong place. Uh, and so now, and it, it surprises me to watch this actually five years later, I, you wouldn't necessarily expect those cut forceps to fit in that narrow gap, but clearly they do. Uh, and so it looks like the disease has been removed properly here. However, I would say that I can't, you know, and this is hindsight years later, I can't really see this area very well. And normally these days, what I would want to do is to put my endoscope, an angled endoscope down into the antero inferior quadrant here and look upwards to see um, this area. And I think the reason I couldn't do it in this case was partly the shape of the ear canal, but partly because the flap is here. And you remember I said, if, if, if we made an incision anteriorly like this, we could peel the eardrum down off the malleus handle, we could pull it down off with, with cut forceps, then all your flap is going to end up down here. So I think perhaps a preferable position for the incision would be to make it inferiorly here and push the flap upwards so that we can then get an endoscope in here and look up into this area. If you don't really follow what I'm saying, I, I wouldn't, you don't really need to worry about it. But the, the point is, uh, really what I'm making here is that when you plan your meatal incision, you don't have to make it in the conventional posterior place like you used to, sorry, the, you don't have to make it posteriorly like you used to with a posterior approach. You can make it superiorly or you can make it inferiorly according to where you need to get for the disease that the, that the patient has. So anyway, we have a, um, access to a KTP laser in our department and, and this is a, a beautiful instrument to use alongside the uh, endoscope uh, and a very nice way of removing any remnants that might have been left behind. I think there's a bit of an attachment of the matrix there so I'm just burning that away uh, and then in a moment I'm going to use it to paint uh, the uh, tensor tympani tendon and the processus cochleiformis. Um, the laser is an expensive tool, but is available in some hospitals, some uh, ophthalmology departments, for example, might have a KTP laser. Uh, and uh, it is very um, easy instrument to use alongside an endoscope, particularly if you put a filter, 532 nanometer filter between the endoscope and the, and the camera, then you don't get that green flash every time you switch it on. And if you use a sucker to uh, evacuate the smoke, so uh, this um, uh, carries on a little bit longer and then the, the drums put back and uh, because this was case was done a long time ago, I have, um, you know, that you might be wondering what happened. Uh, so I did see this kid last summer uh, and they, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that eardrum, but they have a healthy ear uh, with good hearing and no sign of any residual disease over, uh, just over five years later. So um, definitely um, endoscopic surgery is, is feasible in young children. And, um, but when we're starting, 
it's very important not to get obsessed with the idea that you must do it endoscopically. Uh, and I think when you're taking consent from the family, you tell them, you know, I'm going to see if I can do it through the ear canal, but I might have to make a cut behind the ear for access. And uh, the first few times, perhaps you will be making a cut. But as time goes on, as you practice more, you'll get better. And you uh, ultimately, you may find, like me, that you don't really need to... Um, to make that post-auricular incision very much anymore, only when the disease extends extensively into the mastoid. Uh, but at least when you're starting, always make sure that you have a microscope available so that you can bring, bring it in when it's needed. So um, that's the end, really. You, I hope that you could uh, see at the beginning that there are some uh, benefits from using the endoscope in ear surgery. We get less residual cholesteatoma. We definitely get less morbidity. Uh, and then with a um, careful and safe approach, uh, you can learn to uh, use the endoscope for all your ear surgery to good effect. So uh, that's uh, all I have to say. I think there's a bit of time for questions. I couldn't see the chat as I was talking, but um, I am happy to uh, discuss any questions if there are any. I'm trying to um, stop sharing, but it says the program's not responding. Is that your last slide? It okay. is, yeah. Oh, I think it's fine. If it's okay with everybody else, I'm sure that's fine. Louisa? Yes, thank you so much, Prof. James. That was excellent. Um, just with regards to the chat function, there was a, um, a question on the chat function. And the question is really, um, can you not achieve a similar access via the end oral approach? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so uh, in our um, program in Toronto, in the adult hospital at Sunnybrook, they tend to use an end oral approach rather than a post auricular approach. Uh, and so they have been much slower to adopt the endoscopes into their practice. Um, because I think the, the difference for the patient is smaller, yeah, the, the morbidity is smaller. However, um, yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't know really, but I only do a pediatric practice. I think end oral surgery is less common in, in pediatrics, perhaps because the ear canal is smaller. Um, but um, uh, in, in adults, maybe there's less of a difference. However, um, generally, um, people who favor the end oral approach over the endoscope do so because they don't, they don't have experience of using the endoscope. And generally, people who have the ability to do both generally end up preferring to use the endoscope, uh, mostly because they can just see better. And I think that the, the, the advantage that you have of the end oral approach is that you can use two hands with a microscope, although, of course, your view is partly obscured by your hands and your, in, well, by your instruments uh, in front of the uh, microscope lens. But um, the... Um, uh, once you learn how to do the surgery with one hand, the better view that you get is more appealing than the advantage of using your second hand. Thank you so much, um, James. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, um, I don't see any more questions on the chat function. Um, if you do have a question, perhaps we have maybe another two minutes left for questions. Um, and then I'm going to hand back to Prof. Pierre, just and also um, to Dr. Simon, just to chat about our next webinar. Very, very exciting. Um, are there any other? There is another question um, from Daniel. Um, he asks if we could elaborate on middle ear ventilation routes um, of exploration with the endoscope. Uh, Prof, do you have any experience in that? Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the important point there is that. Um, the tensor fold, that's the mucosal membrane that separates the middle ear space from the anterior attic at the level of the supratubal recess, um, typically prevents ventilation um, through that anterior route. And so if there's blockage of the tympanic isthmus, meaning the space between the uh, incus and the facial nerve, if that space is blocked, then there's no ventilation of the attic and the mastoid and gas is gradually uh, consumed, leading to middle ear pressure, and so potentially generating a pars flaccida cholesteatoma. Uh, and um, so a lot of people talk about the benefits of using an endoscope so that you can see these ventilation pathways and open them up. That's, I think, where the question comes from. The problem is that when you do that and you look back a year later, 
that tensor fold that you opened at the first stage of surgery is often scarred over. Uh, so we don't have a reliable way of keeping it open, in my opinion. And secondly, my observation in pediatric disease, most pars tensor disease is more common than pars flaccida in children. So I think the mechanisms of, of cholesterol development are probably different in children from adults. So uh, opening attic ventilation isn't going to prevent cholesterol if you have a pars tensor um, cholesterol in the first place. So I, I think it's a, an interesting area to think about but I'm not sure that it's um, an adequate, uh, I'm not sure that it really translates into patient related outcome measures really. Thank you for that, Prof. James. Um, I'm now going to just ask Prof. Pierre, do you have any comments before we ask um, Dr. Sam Simon just to tell us about our next webinar? Yeah, I, I want to thank Adrian for a wonderful presentation. Um, I must say the dissection, even though it was five years ago, was wonderful. The Thomason and uh, it reminds me of my of my fellowship time. It's a absolutely yeah, maybe, wonderful to watch. You did that offer. one, Shazia. I can't remember how long ago you were here, but maybe that was you <laughs> operating. I, I'm I'm the South Pole videos. You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe we had a third hand. I remember used to suction when I yeah, was doing the uh, the laser because we didn't quite have as many um, instruments in the ear. We needed no, a third. So that's, that's a nice point is, you know, you, you basically things improve as your skills improve and you get more equipment, things advance. So uh, um, yeah, I think I'm, I wasn't very good then, Shazia. I think I've learned how to do it since you were there. <laughs> well, it looks amazing. I think also what's really good is the learning curve. And I think the registrars yeah. now are certainly in our space um, always know about the blue phase because when I came back, I started and um, yeah often went into the blue phase. And I always said, yeah. this is from Adrian James, the blue phase. <laughs> yeah, that's true, you know, that's uh, still happening. Everybody who comes through Red Cross certainly knows about the blue phase. Thank you. It's, for always, it's always good by the end of the operation though, isn't it? You always get past it. Yes, mm. well, it, was, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. I don't thank think there you. are any more questions. And I, and, and I want to thank you, Adrian, as well as Titus and Priyak for just elevating the quality of this presentation and giving lots of African ENT specialists the opportunity to see hands on what happens outside of our borders, especially at a time where we can't travel and we're, we're able to bring the standard of excellence down, down south. Um, I want to hand over to Francois Simon. Uh, if you can take it away on behalf of your IFOS, you've always uh, definitely, um, you're going to tell us about the next webinar. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, I wanted to thank once again, um, Adrian, Briak, and Titus for these excellent presentations, and thank also Cape Town University and Yaifus for the setting up the uh, the webinar. Um, thank you also to Shazia for this uh, for this uh, for this organisation. So for the moment, it's been uh, we've had about a hundred participants, and what's really great is that it's really like uh, the Yaifus. What it represents is that we've had many people from all over the world from. Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, and Americas are connecting to this webinar. So that's really what we what we aim for, and we, we're very grateful for you to have connected. Um, the next webinar will be held uh, probably end of July. So we don't have a specific date yet, but we'll come back to you with that very uh, very quickly. Um, it will be we'll focus probably on speakers from South and North America. As you know, the next IFOS will be held in, in Canada, uh, hopefully uh, in 2022. Uh, and so the webinar will probably be held on their time zone. So we'll try and make, like we did this time, a time zone, which, is, uh, which makes the webinar available to the maximum of people. Uh, but it will probably be centered on the time zone of the speakers from, from America. Uh, the topics are also to be specifically decided with the speakers, but we're aiming for uh, at least one topic on vestibular disease, probably Menier's disease, and the other top topic on the rhinology, uh, rhinology to disease, so probably surgical. So that's it. I I'll be brief because we've had a very dense, uh, dense webinar. And, um, and so I just wanted to thank you very much for this, uh, this uh, great first, uh, first attempt.
Thank you so much, um, Dr. Simon. That's excellent. We really look forward to um, the next webinar. Um, from the UCT um, ENT platform, we just really want to thank everyone for joining. Um, I think we've had an excellent turnout. Um, it's been really interactive. The quality of the presentations were amazing. Um, I don't have enough time to read all the compliments posted on the chat group. Um, but there were multiple compliments to all the presenters. So we thank you for your time. We thank you for joining us. And we thank you to the whole UCT NT platform. And we want to say a special thank you to um, Prof. Pierre as well for really driving this and, um, and getting us really great, wonderful exposure to excellent speakers. Um, so if there's no further comments, um, I think it's about time we close up and wrap up and we look forward to um, our next webinar. Thank you very much, Louisa.